for most of my career, I, I was a popular professor and I had a little bit of exposure on the broader public front. I worked with small television station in Ontario. And so I had a taste of public recognition, let's say. But I didn't become well-known until I was in my mid-50s, you know, and that's protected me, I would say, to some degree against some of the excesses that might otherwise be associated with that. You know, I had a very established family and long-term friends who were accomplished in their own right and like a phalanx of people around me who could counsel me carefully um, as my star rose, so to speak. Now, you're a young man and you've been very successful on multiple fronts and for a very long time. And you, you're, you've garnered great wealth. You've, you've had a lot of entrepreneurial adventures. Now you're running a very public candidacy for presidency, and, but you're 37. And so one of the things, uh, we talked already about the temptations that you faced on the campaign front with regard to the advice that you were receiving from the political class and how you withstood that. And I, I guess I'm curious, and I think this is probably the therapist in me, thinking about someone who's in your situation, is like, and you've provided a partial answer in your, in your understanding that you have a responsibility all, at all these levels of social embeddedness, but how do you keep your, how do you keep your ego from running away from, from you, given your, the particulars of your situation in combination with your youth? Like, what do you have around you that keeps your feet on the ground, do you think, or around you or within you? Honestly, it's very practical and simple. The first thing is my family. I actually am pretty grateful to, um, I, I, I don't know that, I, I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but the best piece of advice I got at the start of this campaign was just like very practical advice from Tucker Carlson, okay? Tucker told me, it's just like very practical stuff. He said, travel with your family. Take your bubble that you live in with you, right? Because, you know, at some point you're going to show up on the road and you're just going to be floating in the ether and waking up in some hotel asking, okay, where am I? And I'm just floating and going through the motions. You're going to feel like that at some point in this campaign. And here's how you protect yourself against that. Whatever you have at home, just take it with you. Or when you don't take it with you, just make it a rule that you want to come back and spend as many nights at home sleeping in your own bed as possible. I came home at 1130 last night. A few nights ago, it was 2 a.m. when I got back from Iowa. Oh, actually, where was it coming from? That was New Hampshire, excuse me. <laughs> Lose track where I'm coming from. But it's 2 a.m. But I still made a point to come back rather than to sleep the night over there because just as a very practical point, there's nothing philosophical about this. It grounds me. I wake up that next morning to the sound of my young son crying and it, it annoys you at first for the first split second. And then it's just joy after that, which is like, that's what you wake up to in the morning. And I think that we're traveling as much as we can as a family. Now, now, my wife has her own version of this, which I wouldn't say is in conflict, but has some logistical attributes that we have to balance, which is her version of also as part of staying grounded in a journey that she did not sign up for. She does not covet attention. She doesn't hide from, she, I don't know if you've ever seen her. She's very earnest and connects with people at a level sometimes that's even deeper than I do with many audiences. And she's not shy about it, but she doesn't covet it in any sense, certainly doesn't seek it. The thing that keeps her grounded is, in addition to our family unit, which is important to her, is she made a decision that I admire her for keeping, is she's kept her full-time job through this. And it is not a lightweight full-time job. She is a throat surgeon. She literally saves lives of people who have gone through cancer at the Ohio you know, Cancer Center, at the James Hospital, at the Ohio State University. People have been through head and neck cancer, the consequences of that. She's a throat surgeon, the best one of the best in the world, certainly at the narrow domain she's in. She has people who fly here to see her. She keeps her operating room schedule. And so let's say I'm in Iowa on a Friday night. There have been cases where she would, days where she will do 12 cases in the day and still be at a dinner event where we're both speaking in Iowa that night. And so for each of us, it's, I think the practical steps, actually, I think we're, and this is where I'm so grateful to Tucker, actually. I, uh, I, launched the campaign actually on his show. And it was just in the chit chat that we had after that, that I got like probably the best practical tip that I have since used throughout this campaign, which is 
as simple as this, whenever you can, just make it a rule, we will travel with our family as a family unit. Whenever that is possible, that is just what we will do. When that is not possible, because Apoorva has to stay in Columbus, Ohio, maybe I'll get one-on-one time with Karthik. She'll stay with Arjun. And when it's not possible for the kids to come, which would be too taxing for them, or they have their activities, I will make an effort. And even if it's 2 a.m., I will be back home in this house where I'm talking to you from. And maybe I'll get an hour less sleep, but I'll be more grateful for it in the morning when I wake up the next day. Well, you know, that that harkens back, that harkens back to this issue and idea of embedded responsibility that we already discussed, you know? So one of the, one of the, uh, what would you call it, errors that the psychotherapeutic community has foisted on the general public, and I think this is true even of the greatest therapists, is the idea that your sanity is something that's somehow located in you. And I don't think that's true. Like, I think your sanity is the harmony that's established between your multiple levels of social embeddedness. And so when you abide by Carlson's advice to take your wife and your children along with you, you're actually taking the structure of responsibility that reminds you to be sane along with you, right? And because we all need to be tapped into harmony and unity. And you do that, not so much, some of it's abiding by your own principles, it's internal, it's pure force of will. But as Carlson pointed out, you know, you can wake up after a month on the road, you're kind of lost and and suspended in space. And that's also the sort of time where a moral error of one form or another is much more likely to occur. But if you're in constant communication with those embedded levels of responsibility, that also keeps you on track, right? In that in that conservative manner that that is part and parcel of secure sanity. And that's another advantage to adopting social responsibility, right? Is you surround yourself with people who remind you to be sane. Yeah, because I don't know about other people, but I'm not a perfect person <laughs> or, or endowed with some sort of divine, you know, infallibility in the in the decisions that we make. And so we just put ourselves in a position to make the moral decision at every step through the structures that have it was, it's not I didn't invent this. My parents demonstrated it by example to me, and I suppose they didn't invent it. It's societies throughout human history in our, in our faith-based tradition. I mean, the Hindu way of life, just as the Judeo-Christian way of life, puts a great premium on this institution of the family. And so I think it actually comes down to just being that practical about it rather than to be overly abstract. It's like, you know, you and I talked about the bats in the cave, I think. You know, I, I, I certainly see us see myself, all of us, I think my generation, maybe all of us as Americans, as human beings today, like blind bats, lost in a cave, right? And the bat, how does it figure out where it is in that cave? It sends out an echolocation signal that bounces back off the wall, and then it comes back and it says, this is where I am. So if we human beings are doing the same thing, this is my family. That's true. That bounces back. It says, this is where I am. I believe in God. I'm a citizen of this nation. Those things come back and say, this is where I am. When those things disappear or they're distant, what happens? We send out these signals and then nothing comes back. And we're back in the desert. (laughs) We're back to being the Israelites in the book of Exodus. We're back to being Americans in 2023. And and so yeah, well, that's part of that problem of overemphasis on subjective self identity. You know, right? This is a big, this is a terrible thing that the radicals on the left have done to people psychologically. Is to tell them you are only what you claim to be. It's like, well, no, that's not true. You're what you've been able to negotiate with other people, and that's a damn good thing for you too. Because as you pointed out about yourself, like isolated and alone. There's no indication at all that we'd be other than, you know, maximally sinful in the direction of our greatest weakness. We need other people. And part of our identity is the ability to integrate ourselves with other people and to use them as signaling devices for our own orientation, as you pointed out. That's a deep psychological truth. And it is practical in the way that you described too, right? It's you distribute the responsibility for your sanity to the community that you take responsibility for. And that works. And that's not an internal or psychological phenomenon. That's a so- phenomenon. That's a social phenomenon. And that's one thing the conservatives knew, I would say, 
in their conservative philosophy that the liberals who are hyper-individualistic miss completely. And you know what? Maybe, maybe those who are saints or the rare saintly individuals who are rare in human history that walk this earth, maybe they don't need that. They're on a higher plane than people like me. I, I think that ordinary people, people like me, need that grounding in order to have my grounding in who I am avoid moral error, as you put it. I think that's an important insight in all of this as well. It might be why you see instances of moral error more often from people who do put themselves in the position to wake up in a given day and not know where I am or feel lost in this aimless passage of time. And so, you know, I, I guess I don't want to discount the possibility that there are a rare few people out there who independently could find that for themselves without creating the structures around them from family to nation to God and belief in God to ground themselves in these things. But I, I certainly think that I am like most people in that, yes, I do need it, we do need it. And part of what we do is, you know, in this, there's this old expression where you, you practice what you preach. I actually feel that what I'm doing much of in this campaign is, it's not that I'm doing that because I'm practicing what I'm preaching. <laughs> It's the reverse. I'm just actually on this campaign preaching what I practice. And I would like to actually share that privilege. I'll use the word, the P word. <laughs> I would like to share that privilege with everyone in this nation, with certainly every kid in this nation, to enjoy the ultimate privilege that I had as a kid, which is not that I grew up in wealth. I did not, actually. But I grew up with two parents in the house with a focus on education, a focus on the family unit, a focus on God. Now, my kids, they are growing up in much greater wealth than I did, but that's not the attribute that makes the difference. We're doing our best to give them that same privilege. Two parents in the house, 2 a.m. or not, two parents in the house with a focus on education, on a focus on the family unit, on the fo with a focus and a belief in God. And why... If I'm aiming to lead this country, why would I want anything other than to share that same privilege with every other kid who's growing up in this country as well? Does that mean that one of the 25% of kids, and it is that high, who are born into fatherless homes or raised in fatherless homes today don't have a shot at achieving everything that I have or people like me have in my life? No. No. In fact, if I'm speaking to one of those kids, I will say that in your unique experience, there is still sources of strength that you will be able to find. It doesn't have to be exactly what mine was. Would we have gotten out of world? Would we have won World War II if FDR didn't have polio? I don't know, actually. I, I, I just, it's a weird question to ask, but, but I don't know. I mean, but does that mean we wish polio upon every U.S. president or every citizen because that's how we protect ourselves? No. And so both of these things can be true at once, that when you encounter hardship, you don't have to be victimized by it. You still can derive at an individual level fortitude from it because if it isn't the two-parent household, then it can be something else that grounds you. But that also should stop us short of saying, oh, well, because somebody else can do it or did do it, that we should wish polio in the FDR analogy case or a single-parent household in the case of a quarter of people in this country's case upon everybody else. No. And I think that both of those things can be true at once. And so what I'm saying here, I want to be very careful that that doesn't negate hope or possibility 